Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Kim Boyer. I'm the um, president of the Tasmanian branch of the Institute, Australian Institute of International Affairs, who's hosting this event in conjunction with the team from IMAS. Um, this is a, a really important event, and we always have at least one event on Antarctica. Probably this year we're going to have two, um, because it is so important for us nationally in terms of national security and national agenda. I also particularly want to pay respect to the Palawa people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and um, pay the respects of both the university and the AIIA um, for the traditional owners of this land um, on which we meet. These people have maintained the culture of country on land that has uh, was is always theirs and always will be and has never been ceded. So I think it's a very important recognition for, as we meet here to talk about Antarctica, that um, the traditional owners in both the places where we are um, zooming from and here um, are recognised as that appropriate. Now, I have great pleasure passing over to Professor Tony Press, who's going to uh, chair the session, which is going to be talking about Antarctica, past, present and future in terms of governance and the impact of world politics on this fragile country. Thank you. Welcome. We've got a great panel tonight, but before I introduce them, I'd like to point out that I don't think I've seen 10 days that have had so much on Antarctic geopolitics in the blogosphere, in newspapers, and coming from really strange sites on, on, on the internet, mainly because of the global shift in geopolitics between the hegemony of the United States and its allies and the rise of China. And this is filtering in to the politics and geopolitics of, of Antarctica. And that's what we'll be talking about tonight. We've got a distinguished list of speakers. Professor Marcus Howard. Over three decades of of, of work in Antarctic governance and oceans governance. Dr. Lynn Goldsworthy, who is a long time <laughs> campaigner, <laughs> participant, and policymaker in Antarctic and oceans affairs. Shirley Scott, a distinguished legal professor at the University of New South Wales. Indy Hudson Johnson, who's just been appointed to a position here at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies, but who did a beautiful piece of work for her thesis on sovereignty in Antarctica and sovereignty being the cornerstone of the negotiation of the Antarctic Treaty. And Professor Geoffrey McGee from IMAS and the Law School at the University of Tasmania. So we will hear tonight about the past, the present, and the future. And then I have some very important questions to put to the panel, but I hope you do as well, because what I'll do is try and corral everybody and the times that they <clears throat> spend speaking, to give you enough time to interrogate them about the things that are important to you and the important questions you have. And before I vacate the floor and ask Marcus Howard to come to the microphone, I'd like to acknowledge Sir Guy Green. Yeah. 
Well, his presence here, Guy. Thanks, Tony, and uh, it's really great to see Sir Guy here. Um, if I've had three decades of Antarctic uh, work, um, uh, Sir Guy's interest goes a lot further back than that and still currently important uh, influence on many of us in, in encouraging us to, to work on Antarctic matters. Uh, this panel are also colleagues in a, a funded project under the Australian Research Council looking at uh, issues in Antarctic geopolitics. And we've had a lot of fun over what started to be three years and a pandemic got in the way. So we've, we've actually been going for about five years on the work. Uh, uh, and I have the great pleasure at the moment of putting together the final report. And although I'm no longer formally employed by the university, it's very pleasing to say that we have over 55 publications of various sorts out of the, out of the um, uh, uh, project. But also more importantly, uh, active engagement, because impact's also important if you've been following the other debate that's been going on around the country about the University Accord, about impactful research, I believe. And I would say this, wouldn't I? Um, we have been doing impactful research in, in that, and engaging and thanking our colleague, engaging with our colleagues, and I thank them in, in government for their work. I've got a very uh, short brief um, to cover the, the most, most significant period of uh, Antarctica. That is the period of the 1950s, but le looking back a little bit before it and then looking forward, in a sense, the past is a key to the present and in a sense influential to the future. The Antarctic Treaty, you all, all here are aficionados, you know about the Antarctic Treaty. It was negotiated at the height of the Cold War at a time when uh, there was mutual suspicion and distrust between the USA and the USSR. Very much debated a debate to whether, um, whether the Soviet Union would be invited to the Antarctic Conference in Washington in 1958. Australia played a significant role through the person, personality and influence of uh, Richard Casey, then Minister for External Affairs, who had significant influence on encouraging the United States to invite the Soviet delegates to Washington. Now, interestingly, this was all done in Australia rather than in Washington. Um, Casey didn't attend the Washington conference, but we famous, he famously said, when people asked him about why Australia was so engaged in Antarctic, he said, it's a, an area of close and immediate concern. And that <laughs> continues to be the, the significant factor. The 1950s was a period where there were a number of drivers for uh, a geopolitical change and tension. The Antarctic problem emerged at the end of the Second World War, one of a number of problems in the immediate post-war uh, period. Uh, we had the Berlin problem, um, the divided city in four powers um, managing um, Berlin. Berlin. We had the Trieste problem, what to do with Trieste in the, at the end of the war in the Balkans. We, we had, had the Jerusalem problem, the problem of Jerusalem, and we had the Antarctic problem. One of those problems still remains as a difficulty, um, and it's not Antarctica. The Antarctic problem surfaced because at the end of the 1940s, Chile and Argentina's territorial claims were, in a sense, reinforced by state action in that period. And it, the claims on the peninsula overlapped with the earlier claim of the United Kingdom. We also had the USA and the Soviet Union interested in um, the southern continent and indicating that they were keen to play a significant role in shaping the Antarctic's future. We also had a number of interesting other factors here that the role of science through the vehicle of the International, uh, the International Geophysical Year of 1957-58 and the setting up of parameters around that uh, period, including the standstill proposal that no territorial acquisition could be made during that period of time, which filtered through along with the emphasis on scientific collaboration and peaceful engagement into the Antarctic Treaty. 
in a sense, the Antarctic Treaty is um, a peace treaty. And it's a peace treaty that, that sets aside territorial disputes, demilitarises a continent, creates the world's first nuclear free zone, and in a sense then um, provides a, an institutional form and framework for collaborative engagement where, in a sense, geopolitical disputes were, in the words of Sir Robert Menzies, speaking at the first Antarctic Treaty Consultative meeting in Canberra in 1961. In, uh, in July, I think it was, that meeting was held and Sir Robert made the comment that it was the most appropriate uh, uh, time to be meeting in, um, about the Antarctic because it was freezing cold outside, apparently. But Sir Robert Menzies said, the framers of the Antarctic Treaty had been very clever in a sense uh, in keeping the contentious disputes outside the, the realm of uh, discussion. And so in a way, the lessons of the 1950s and the 19, into the 1960s, but in particular the period between 1957 and 1961 when the treaty was formed, showed that we can work and set up a, a regime a legal framework and a, a set of institutions that have evolved that are in a time of tension and that external events, while being influential and <laughs> I, I, <laughs> external events um, can shape and will shape things. So in a sense, what are the lessons from the 1950s? Certainly great power politics played a significant part in the negotiations of the Antarctic Treaty and its uh, evolution. Uh, the United Nations and its involvement was mentioned. Um, India and Sweden were very concerned that uh, the UN should be more involved. In a sense, our project was investigating how far the past shaped the present and, and, and potentially the future. So we look at the present as, and, and the future uh, and the presentations to come. And I think you'll, you'll see that some of these themes recur. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much, Marcus. And I'd like to now bring um, to the meeting online, Dr. Linda Goldsworthy, um, who's worked in all areas of the Antarctic Treaty System <laughs> in many different capacities, and who's just finished uh, major work on the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources and the work of <coughs> uh, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources and its commission. So, Lee. If major work means a PhD, then yes, <laughs> major work. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources and its commission, which is generally known as CAMELAR. And let me open by declaring my starting point, which is that Camelar is a conservation-based regime which has fisheries responsibilities rather than a regime focused on managing fisheries. And I think this is very clear from the intent of the negotiators of the convention, from the articles of the convention, and indeed from statements made within um, uh, commission meetings. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with what the objective of CAMELAR is, and that is the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources, which if you put it in 2024 terms would be understood as the conservation of Antarctic biodiversity. Within this overarching objective, rational use is permitted. It is not over or above. It is within the um, conservation objective. And then there is specific guidance given on how one particular rational use, that is fishing, can be undertaken. And the commission has also been given direction to make its decisions based on precautionary and ecosystem-based approaches and using the best scientific information available. And I think for many years, it's reasonable to say that Kamala was quite successful in its endeavours, at least when it was focusing around the management of its active fisheries. 
And it was really only when attention turned to the broader um, conservation goal that things started to go a tad pear-shaped. And for anyone that's been around Kamala will know that for the past 10 years or so, the Commission has struggled to conclude its commitment on the implementation of a representative system of marine protected areas, which was originally mooted to be in place by 2012. And for the past five years, we've seen increasing struggles around progressing um, fisheries regulation uh, proposals, implementing policy responses um, to climate change impacts. And we've also seen the closure of a well-established and well-managed fishery on the basis of the rejection of peer-reviewed science by one member. So it would be reasonable to say that um, the atmosphere of the scientific committee and commission meetings these days reflects both tension and frustration. So my research focused on the linkages between these problems and the key underlying behaviours or actions. Now, some of those actions arise directly from concerns to protect national fisheries aspirations, because if you think about it, commercial fishing is likely to be prohibited in many of the marine um, areas set aside for protection. And climate response measures could also close off areas to fishing and or reduce catch limits. Other actions are more related to global geopolitics and are not necessarily Kamala specific, um, which makes for some quite interesting discussions sometimes. Although it's difficult to separate out, what I want to do is mention a few key um, actions, noting, of course, that there are many others and other people may interpret mine differently, but I think that these will provide some insight into uh, the Camilla of 2024. So in no particular order, number one is the strengthening of differing views of how to interpret the objective, which is why I started with the objective. If we ignore the first few settling in years, there was a generally, general understanding that the objective safeguarded the global values of the region established under the treaty. So peace, uh, collaborative science and conservation, while also allowing the orderly develop of, development of fishing within and aligned with those values and commitments. And that remains the majority view. Conservation within that, rational use, and within that, here is how you can do fishing. In 2014, China put on the table a different view, which actually reversed the logic of um, Article 2, the objective. That is, Kamalara is responsible for fisheries management where conservation is achieved through good fisheries management and it should not impede fisheries activities or aspirations. And that's the view that is currently presented by China and Russia and is used particularly to oppose marine protected areas. The second action we see a lot relates to the breakdown of well-established uh, Kamalan norms and practices, which are used in international treaties to operationalize rules. This is really clearly evident in the use of veto by China and Russia. Instead of the consensus forming, let's all work together collaboratively to build a mutually agreed position, which is the agreed normal understanding of how you reach agreement within Kamala. So proposals are, are, are rejected without alternatives being um, offered and new arguments are presented when the initial concerns are addressed. And these two nations also play this ridiculous game of um, uh, questioning consensus is the absence of objection, which is also a long-held understanding within Kamala. And that's resulted in much wasted time where everyone feels the need to uh, make lengthy, repetitive statements to ensure their views are recorded, 
or the equally irritating opaque practice of reporting some nations said this while other nations said that, and it looks like it's equal, but it isn't. Another example of the breakdown of norms and practices concerns attempts to legalize terms and processes. To, so to get hard legal definite consensus agreed hard um, legal definitions of, for instance, marine protected area or best available science. Despite the fact that generally when there is an issue like this, there are understandings um, reached and reflected in the public reports of the commission. And more fundamentally, this is a customary norm in um, international regimes that you avoid legal definitions because they're extremely challenging to achieve which one presumes is the reason why they're being raised. The um, specific issues faced by the Commission are also interconnected with strong national aspirations and interests of some nations. And we have a willingness of a minority of states to um, fight for those interests over and above their um, multilateral obligations. China, for instance, has stated its intention to build both geopolitical and fishing interests in the Antarctic. And they see, for instance, marine protected areas, thank you, Tony, um, uh, as um, um, cutting their, uh, their um, options for future cruel fisheries expansion. And they see the current lack of capacity to participate in research and monitoring in marine protected areas as um, undermining their potential influence. And on the international arena, Russia has stated its desire to overturn the rules-based international order, and they're quite comfortable to use Antarctic, indeed other regimes as well, to generate concerns and problems. And then I will just briefly mention that uh, the breakdown of Antarctic exceptionalism, which I think uh, others will raise, and the growth of new geopolitical groupings are playing their part. Uh, until recently, the Antarctic Treaty System had the implicit acceptance of other international bodies that they, the Antarctic Treaty System, was the body to manage human activities, and we seem to be doing a good job. Now, however, the failure of the marine protected area commitment and other issues around climate change and also the growing expertise on um, issues such as um, microplastics external to the Antarctic Treaty nations is making countries look more at what the Antarctic is doing. So I um, will end there, but just with a couple of where does Kamala go? I would proffer a couple of thoughts. It could just gradually become a relatively good regional regional um, fisheries management organization and give up completely on conservation aspirations. It could reassert its original intent and return Antarctic values of peace, collaborative science and, and conservation. Or they could have a aha moment. This is my one. Um, and become custodians of a region that's dedicated to the maintenance of planetary health. And I guess the end statement is watch this space. Thank you. And thank you very much, Lynn. And uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to tell us sometime in the future about what that end space might look like. So I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Shirley Scott to talk to us about her impressions of where the Antarctic Treaty system, particularly the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, uh, is at the moment and her impressions of the geopolitical um, inside of her first ATCN. Thanks very much, Tony, for the introduction and good evening, everyone. It's lovely to be joining you. Last year, I had the opportunity to attend an ATCM for the first time. And this was just wonderful for me after having written about Antarctica, you know, in an academic way for a number of years. So I thought I'd use my time 
this evening just to share a few rather idiosyncratic perhaps uh, impressions of, of the ATCM. So first of all, what is it? Well, it's an Antarctic Treaty Consultative meeting, essentially where the business of the ATS is carried out. Consultative parties, are the original parties to the treaty and others acceding to the Antarctic Treaty during such times as they're conducting substantial scientific research activity there. Since 1994, these ATCMs have been held annually in different cities, uh, moving around. The meeting takes decisions by consensus, understood as the absence of formal objection. The institutionalisation of the Antarctic Treaty system uh, developed really during the life of the regime and in 2003 a secretariat was established. And if you want to see more of the papers and so on from an ATCM, you could look at the website of the secretariat and that's where you'd find the report and papers presented at the meeting. So last year the ATCM was held in Helsinki and that was quite funny actually telling friends and acquaintances that I was going to some Antarctic meetings and heading north to do so. <laughs> uh, the ATCM took place from the 30th of May to the 8th of June. And that may not seem a very long time, but actually it's quite an intensive period of time. And more than one person commented to me, which actually I felt a little bit relieved about, that it takes certainly more than one attendance at an ATCM to really understand everything that's going on just because as I say it's intensive there's there's things happening in the meeting room there's associated events and so on as I say I was there as an academic observer at the invitation of Russell Miles director of the Antarctic section and I'd like to thank him very much for the opportunity because it will certainly influence my writing going forwards there are also observers from related institutions, Kamala, for example, and from various international organisations, both governmental and non-governmental, such as IATO that uh, conducts considerable of the regulation of the tourism industry. The ATCM was held in conjunction with a meeting of the Committee for Environmental Protection. The Australian delegation really did us proud, led by Adam McCarthy, and one of his interventions that I still remember was about the importance of the rules-based international order and the, uh, the chart of the United Nations is like the trunk of the tree and the Antarctic Treaty is a branch and, and so on. It really captured Australia's um, uh, value for rules-based international order and support for the Antarctic Treaty system very well. Uh, so here's the venue. Actually, I probably should have given you a photo of the view out of the window <laughs> rather than this one from a ferry of the of the hotel. But it was right on the edge of the harbour in Helsinki. It's a beautiful harbour with lots of little islands, boats to ferries that you could go across if you had a break and so on. Within the ATCM, there were plenaries sort of bookending the meetings. But for much of the time, the Committee on Environmental Protection was meeting downstairs and working incredibly hard on many technical points. And the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting itself was upstairs. Uh, one of the things that really came through to me was the value of background or institutional knowledge, if you like. And Australia, of course, having been there from the beginning with the Antarctic Treaty, really has a lot of that institutional knowledge and it comes through in their interventions and their contributions. As far as geopolitics beyond Antarctica is concerned, you could feel it and particularly at certain points. So for example, the Ukraine war had been a big issue the previous year and this last year, Russia uh, had prepared a working paper on it, what it criticized as the politicization of the ATCM and thought that an issue such as Ukraine should not come into play at all. Um, so there were these various points where it, it, it 
as I say, politics beyond Antarctica was overtly mentioned, but much of the business of the meetings was conducted without it being overtly referred to. Thought I'd just give a few of the highlights uh, for me. Uh, first of all, there was quite an emphasis or theme, if you like, in some of the discussions on the prohibition on Antarctical min mineral resource activities. There was a resolution reaffirming the commitment to Article 7 of the protocol and to dispelling the myth that the ban was going to expire in 2048 or at any other time. And considerable concern that this image of the ban is going to expire at some time led to agreement on changed wording on the website of it. And um, that's what it says. Essentially, that it's not impossible for the ban to be overturned at some point, but that it would be quite a complicated process to uh, for that to come about. So if you're interested in that, you could look at the website to read it again. There was also a declaration passed on climate change, and this recognised the seriousness of the issue. Of course, it's quite a tricky one for the Antarctic Treaty System because much of the activity that impacts Antarctica from a climate change point of view is taking place outside Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. But nevertheless, there is a role for the ATS in addressing it. The last paragraph of the declaration returned to that issue about the mineral resource ban not having an expiry date and I think that the parties wanted to emphasise uh, that their commitment to, to the ATS as not being all about joining the club and being poised to extract fossil fuels that will make climate change worse when, it, you know, when the moment came. I was really interested in what was going to be said about tourism. Back in 2001, I'd written a piece pointing out that the protocol applies the precautionary principle to mining more so than to tourism. And last year, there was a decision to begin a dedicated process to develop a comprehensive and consistent framework for the regulation of tourism and non-governmental activities in Antarctica. So I think that's a watch this space in the years going forward to see how that takes shape. Um, but certainly there seemed to be increased political uh, uh, preparedness to regulate that more strongly from within the ATS itself. And lastly, I thought I'd mention another highlight for me, which was uh, the SCAR lecture on Antarctic research. So every year, apparently, there is a, a guest lecturer who presents a, a sort of um, accessible scientific lecture. And this one um, looked into the role that changing satellite technology is playing in Antarctic research and Antarctic exploration and underlined the fact that whereas traditionally you had to get, well, you had to get to Antarctica to conduct Antarctic science, that's no longer the case to a great extent. And there may well be others even in the room with you this evening who could talk to that in more scientific detail. But as far as the ATS is concerned, it's, it's quite a significant point, I think, given, as I say, to be a consultative party involves conducting science. So I wonder whether in future countries may make the point that even though they're not travelling to Antarctica to conduct their science, they may be doing so through uh, using this sort of technology and so on. I think it's an issue that could come up in various contexts going forwards in the system. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And um, it, it's really good to, to have an impression from somebody that's only been to one uh, Antarctic Treaty Consulting meeting because a few people in the room have been to many. Uh, and the things that happen outside of, of the meeting itself are really important and, and your observation um, about the meeting is, is, is 
a, a great way of thinking yourself about how to interpret the meetings and how decisions get made. Somebody who's been in the interstices of, of um, Antarctic Treaty meetings and Camelot meetings too, um, Indy Hodson Johnson uh, will respond to Shirley uh, and will tell us her impressions of the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting uh, and the ATS. Thanks, Tony. And thanks, Shirley and Lynn and Marcus for um, setting the scene a bit for us. Um, so yes, I work within the system. So I work for the Antarctic Treaty Secretariat. I'm a millennial, so I've got many side gigs. That's one of them. Um, but I guess what I'm coming to this evening is, is more an internal look. And I don't know, some people say, oh, Indy, that's really boring. But I think it goes to the robustness of the Antarctic Treaty system. So I've gone to seven meetings as a rapporteur. Um, this year I'll be going to India as chief rapporteur. So my role is to um, write the reports, which is the public record. Um, the things that our students read, the things that um, our governments read as a record and a true record that's decided by consensus by all the parties. Um, I guess over the seven years that I've been doing this, I have noticed the complexities of geopolitics, of um, increased complexities of agendas and all sorts of things like that that place pressure on the meetings themselves in order to get that consensus. Um, whether it be in the Committee for Environmental Protection under the Madrid Protocol or the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meetings under the Antarctic Treaty. So either the meetings themselves are too short or they're too ambitious. There's, there's I think, increasingly running out of time, perhaps uh, looking at issues and, and doing a lot of interpretive exercise that goes around and around in circles that Lynn described in part of, as part of CAMLA. Same sorts of things happen at the ATCMs, and increasingly so. From a diplomatic perspective, I think um, what we're also seeing is a turnover of the the old school of the um, you know the traditional Antarctic Treaty parties, uh, those that have been around the traps, and increasing diversity, which is you know we want diversity um, and diversity of thinking, but that brings in its own uh, complexities in achieving consensus and a good process, a, a good efficient process to get through this very ambitious agenda that comes about from these pressures we have from climate change, uh, from increasing tourism, from uh, more parties, uh, things like avian flu and new technology, they're all coming at these parties that are generally probably quite slow in terms of response. But we also have a growing complexity of the institutions in which um, we're trying to organise all this. So diplomatically, we need to see a little, probably a bit more succession planning, perhaps a bit more um, mentoring of newer parties that are coming in, even the non-consultative parties, the ones that don't vote. Um, so the knowledge is passed on, but the processes also have to be observed. And I think perhaps that lack of knowledge, uh, knowledge passing on between the generations of different um, people attending these meetings is incredibly important. So for example, uh, we've got nations that don't speak one of the four languages of the Antarctic Treaty. We've got um, Russian, French, Spanish, and English are the four um, languages that the um, meeting operates in. So we've got translators and interpreters. Um, but if you don't speak one of those languages as your first language, it is a struggle. And with this complex agenda that they're facing, I think that faces a real challenge. Um, if we are to bring a more diverse um, range of voices into the into the system, more broadly, um, we we talk about these um, different opinions. We'll possibly even talk about it. We've mentioned it a couple of times, but we monitor that rhetoric around the Antarctic Treaty system. Um, this morning, we see a lot of mistakes. We see a lot of misinformation. You can see the parties trying to um, what Shirley mentioned, trying to battle this. You know. Does the um, protocol expire in 2048? I think this morning I saw an article that the Antarctic Treaty will expire in 2041, which is it's just uh, it's constant. It's constant misinformation. And um, if you ever use ChatGPT, the students in the room, that gives you a terrible outlook of the Antarctic Treaty system, which is fundamentally wrong in so many ways because of this level of misinformation that it's feeding into. Um, so I think reflecting on that, um, what can we do with that? I think perhaps 
the Antarctic Treaty consultative parties, uh, all the members um, can perhaps reflect on how they communicate outwards. I think, yeah, sure, we have Helsinki declarations, we have um, resolutions, we have the report, which is sometimes, you know, 400 pages long. But is that the best way to communicate the work that is happening and is achieved? Because a lot does get achieved and we often focus on um, the negative. So I think this fits in with what Jeff's going to go into a bit about um, the legal rigour and the attention of the process and the pressures that the Antarctic Treaty um, consultative meetings in particular are under and Kamala um, from what Lynn said. But some of these behaviours and practices and refocusing on the objectives and purposes and making sure those are achieved within these really complex meetings are really important. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Indy. And um, now we move on to the future, looking at the past. Um, Jeffrey McGee has been one of the principal investigators of the project that we've been working on and um, co-author of a very important book. Where's he gone? Co-author of a, a very important book on Antarctic geopolitics, Jeffrey. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Tony. And um, for, for those in the room, I'm being very brave here. I got this electronic notepad this afternoon. It's the first time I've used it, so I'm just waiting for it to freeze on me so I won't have my notes, but hopefully that, that won't happen. Um, look, um, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces in the audience and, and some new faces as well. Um, what I've been asked to talk about is, um, I guess, future drivers of geopolitical change in Antarctica and within the treaty system. We've done a lot of work in the project, um, looking at scenario narratives about the future of Antarctica. I won't touch on that tonight, but what I'll do is basically talk about three broad drivers of, of geopolitical change um, or risk in the region. One being political, one being technological, and the third being biophysical. Now look, in terms of um, political um, drivers of change, um, Tony touched on this earlier, it's the idea of wider tensions within the international system spilling over into, into Antarctica. I mean, when we think about this historically, we go back to the 1950s when Marcus was, uh, Marcus's talk, where um, the treaty settled tensions in the region, okay? We move forward to the early 1980s and we talk about the Falklands War or the Isle of Malvinas War, Bruno. <laughs> um, and um, we make the observation that the UK and Argentina were largely able to keep that out of the treaty meeting process. However, um, as Tony mentioned, we seem to be in a new era in global geopolitics where there are challenges to the 30 years prior of US sort of hegemony in the system. So what we're seeing is essentially countries such as uh, the Russian Federation, um, China to an extent, Iran to an extent, exhibiting behaviour outside the Antarctic region that is in some ways spilling over into the region. Shirley mentioned that in the treaty meetings we've had um, the Ukraine conflict mentioned on the floor, we've had diplomatic walkouts as protests, we've had statements back from Russia. So that's clearly sort of spilling into the meeting um, as much as the meeting's then gone on, you know, largely, you know, in a, in a usual or normal way, that sort of um, theatre at the start of Antarctic Treaty meetings is something very new and unusual. Um, Iran recently, in uh, the last three or four months, there's been statements out of Navy officials in Iran about the fact that they are going to claim sovereignty over parts of Antarctica and construct a military um, base in Antarctica. It's a little hard to work out whether this is official Iranian policy or whether it's Navy admirals kind of freelancing, but um, it's, you know, a strange situation. This is a non-party, so they're outside the treaty system. They're not one of the 56 actually, you know, in some ways asserting a claim to sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And also um, China, um, as Lynn has mentioned in Kamala, there's obviously issues with the Marine Protected Area um, issue. Um, but also when we look forward, we must think, you know, to what extent if there is wider conflict within the Indo-Pacific region, perhaps over Taiwan, how would that impact upon the treaty meetings and the Antarctic region? So those sort of political 
issues in the wider system spilling over into the treaty, uh, into the region, into the treaty meetings is something which is one of the key drivers. The second key driver is technological. Um, there's a whole bunch of kit in Antarctica, uh, kit's a scientific word, <laughs> a term of art for things like ground station receivers, GPS style stations, telescopes, and also ocean sensors that can be hooked up into military and intelligence command control communication systems at a global level, okay? Now, um, it's always a question as to whether um, it's worth having that sort of equipment in Antarctica when it might be better to actually have it somewhere else if you want to use it for connection into those systems, okay? Um, certainly good analysts like Claire Young from um, the, in the Lowy Interpreter have always pointed out that there is no great advantage in using that sort of equipment in the Antarctic region that you can't get from using that equipment in other places in the world. So why would you bother using, uh, you know, putting equipment into Antarctica for that purpose, okay? Having said that, of course, we don't want the Antarctic Treaty to system to move into a situation where Article 1, the non-militarisation provision is under threat in the sense that there's a creeping slow use of this sort of kit or equipment for not only scientific purposes, but also being linked up into these wider military intelligence systems. So that's another thing that has to be watched, another driver of potential um, you know, technological change to the system. Now, the third one is biophysical, and that is the issue of climate change, which has been mentioned previously. Um, the, the, the problem here is that climate change is being generated from greenhouse gas emissions, which are being emitted not in the Antarctic Treaty area largely. Uh, they're, they're being emitted in other parts of the world, but Antarctica is feeling the, the heat, so to speak, from the, the impact of those emissions. Now, um, there are more and more calls from um, academia, um, from the NGO community, from the public more generally, for the Antarctic Treaty system to do something about that and to solve that problem to protect the region. Bad news is the Antarctic Treaty system doesn't have the ability to regulate global greenhouse gas emissions, nor will it ever likely have that ability, okay? It can do great work in generating science. It can get into the UNFCCC meetings where that greenhouse gas, gas mitigation is meant to occur, but it can't do the job which some critics say that it should do. And if it doesn't do, it's a failure, okay? So this is a source of criticism and delegitimization of the system that, as I said, often well-meaning, but coming out of different parts of academia and the NGO movement, which is a potential challenge and geopolitical delegitimization of the Antarctic Treaty um, system itself. So we get criticisms um, of the system. And a lot of the commentary we're seeing, you know, of, of the last few years um, starts from the assumption that these three drivers that I've spoken of uh, mean that the system is in crisis, the treaty system's in crisis, or it's not fit for purpose. You, you hear these lines quite, quite regularly in academic and NGO writings, um, such that some NGOs have actually uh, put forward alternative arrangements, um, an Antarctic Declaration of Rights, uh, which, which has been circulated. Now, I'm, I guess, going here to argue, and this draws on a piece which came out in the Lowy Interpreter this morning with Richard Rowe and myself. Um, we, in that piece, argue that it's really important to um, look at what international law through the Antarctic Treaty System can do in the region. And what we say in that piece is that um, it, the Antarctic Treaty System can facilitate cooperation. That's been its main job. That's what we always think of in terms of scientific cooperation and the generation of that sort of activity. Um, but the other important part of international law is actually managing conflict that inherently arises in the international system and making sure that conflict is dealt with within the rules and the discourse of international law within uh, the system itself. And when we look at the Antarctic Treaty System from that angle, we think it's actually performing still quite well. As much as there might be tension in Kamla over MPAs, the reasons that are given by China and Russia and other countries for not, a, not providing consensus are all within, the, I guess, the accepted practices and discourses of Kamla. 
I mean, some in the room have been in those meetings may say that that's being strained, but it's not like, you know, China and Russia just, you know, blatantly say no for, for, for no apparent reasons. There are reasons given as much as we mightn't agree with them, but it's within the rules and within the processes, within the discourse of international law that's been set up under that instrument. So um, whilst the, that is occurring, whilst we aren't seeing countries stepping out of the system and, and trying, trying to go a separate path or just blatantly ignoring and breaching rules, I think we shouldn't get too down on the Antarctic Treaty system and we should be looking at ways to bolster it, such as use of inspection mechanisms and other ways which we can do that. I think I'll leave it there, Tony. Thank you. So while the um, panel members... Thank you, Geoffrey. And while the panel members take their seats at the front and also behind their screens, and good luck with the footy. Um, <coughs> I'll look around the room if there's anybody that wishes to ask a question. I'm going to open up um, by asking the panel a question and then we've got at least 15 minutes for um, questions from the floor. My question to the panel is it's, it's based on the, the Andrew Jackson end of the scale of Antarctic conflict, and that is um, the optimists say that situations like this where there are, there's obstruction, there's lack of progress, don't last forever, and the system can respond to that, um, usually, but not always if there's a crisis or if there's an event that needs to be dealt with, such as the collapse of the uh, Minerals Convention and the negotiation, the rapid, uh, unprecedented negotiation of the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty. My question to the panel uh, is, the current situation in which the geopolitics are playing out in which there is a seemingly endless use of um, lack of consensus to progress um, consideration of marine protected areas, fishing quotas, uh, other things in the Antarctic Treaty System. How long do you think that will last? And how do you think it will change into a new state. <laughs> Everyone, everyone's pointing at, uh, at, at Jeff, <laughs> particularly Marcus, but I think he should have answered it. <laughs> so the question, Tony, is um, yeah, the, the current state of relative conflict within the system, how, how, how long will that likely last? And, how long would it likely shift into a... a or, or how can it shift into another state? Yeah. Um, look, my, my personal view is I think that's um, likely to last some time because I think it is a reflection of those wider shifts within the international system. So there are, you know, there are pressures outside that are causing, you know, those states to take a more um, a combative or a more difficult position in the meetings than we than we expected say 10 or 15 years ago okay um so but but having said that um i, I think what a few things can shift into a different um state one being you know that wider um that wider political context shifting so if that shifts to a more benign state then of course we can hope that that flows on within the system but the other way it can shift, I think, is by, um, you know, innovative and constructive diplomacy to try and deal with those issues in perhaps other ways so that, um, you know, that countries taking positions don't lose face in terms of having to back down from existing entrenched positions, but being able to 
achieve results in perhaps other ways. So, yeah, that, that's the way I, I think it could happen too. Lynn, would you like to respond? Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, I just want to say that not all those related or not all of those in the NGO movement believe that the Antarctic Treaty System is not good. Many of those in the NGO community believe that the Antarctic Treaty System is stable and a good uh, option. Um, but in, in terms of your question, um, Tony, I think there um, are a couple of issues that we need to think about in this context. One is that we have international um, things going on that have nothing to do with the Antarctic Treaty System. That was not the case during the mining moment. Um, and I also think we have to think about Kamalara being different to the Antarctic Treaty because there is immediate resource issues in play in Kamala to Antarctic. But on overall, I think that the Antarctic Treaty nations, if they wish to get on top of this, can get on top of this. They have shown that they have the capacity to do that and they can do that again now. Tony, can I just make a, a quick comment that we, ha we have had this situation in the past and one of the interesting things for me was um, Argentina's refusal or walking away from a, a, a direct invitation to join the BRICS group, the Brazil, Russia, Russia India, China, China, South Africa. And Argentina was, you know, yeah, there, there was, was some, some discussion about, about whether Argentina, Argentina would join the BRIC lot. Sounds like they go masters. Um, but if we go back to the 1980s, we saw significant challenges to the work of Kamala, particularly in its foundation years, ended uh, with external factors impacting on uh, and the Soviet Union switching its focus away from sort of politics to back to science. So it could be possible for these things. Now, of course, what happened to the breakup of the Soviet Union is probably reverberating now through and could be as an opposite. You know, what was a solution in one sense has become a, a problem now, so. Okay, I'm going to the audience. Um, thank you, Marcus. Over here, Andrew Constable. Uh, yeah, thanks, Amy. Thanks, panel, for terrific set of presentations. Um, I really enjoyed it. Just on, on this particular question before I ask my question, um, would um, equally apply belligerence from all parties be such a bad thing? No fishing anywhere, um, then you could be achieving <laughs> conservation objectives. And then when everybody's nice to one another, you might be able to proceed on other matters. So belligerence equally applied may be quite useful. Um, but that's not my question. <laughs> one of the things that in, in my experience over the last five years, I've written quite a long question, I'm not going to make it that long. But one of the experiences that I've had over the last years um, with the IPCC, with Camelar, um, with, with, is that on? Yeah. Uh, with Camelar and, and other forums, um, I've become quite um, disgruntled with the overall global narrative uh, about environment, about resources, and about geosecurity. Um, and that disgruntlement is largely driven by the fact that we get driven down these rabbit burrows never seem to emerge with a solution. Uh, science has played a big part in that, trying to show how much worse it's getting, and even worse and even worse, <laughs> and yet we're still not finding solutions. My question is about this. Given that resources in Antarctica are no longer important, seabed mining, moon mining, whichever place you would like to look, but not Antarctica, um, also the fact that you don't need Antarctica to observe uh, geosecurity, uh, satellite, geo undersea systems, and so on. Um, Antarctica is actually no longer relevant in what was relevant over, over the last two to 300 years. Is it possible for the Antarctic Treaty System collectively to create a new narrative which actually does seek to find solutions which are about harmonising environment, resources, and security, and finding a way through that mess 
and perhaps that with um, equally applied belligerence, there might be a, a way forward. <laughs> but I'm just wondering if the Antarctic Treaty System can actually play a part in reorienting the world around the way it answers these very difficult questions. Uh, before I ask the audience, uh, the, sorry, the panel generally, I'm going to ask Lynn, is that part of your, your future vision, Lynn? Yeah, um, I thought I saw Andrew in the audience. Um, uh, great question. I mean, I I think that there is a possibility that it's a what I would call a modicum of a possibility, and therefore worth chasing. That the the coalition of ideas around. Um, sorry, there's a very loud. Uh, cockatoo yelling at me outside the window. Um, the coalition of ideas around the role of the Antarctic, both in mitigating and exacerbating climate change, the, the um, push for ocean health and 30 by 30 percent of um, oceans protected and marine protected areas, the fact that the Antarctic is uh, the Southern Ocean is largely, the biodiversity is largely still intact. The fact that the, the fishing in Antarctica is globally insignificant and not part of food security, all of those things make me think that there is a possibility that the Antarctic Treaty nations could go under pressure from other parts um, external to them well, maybe we should actually take this step and protect this region for um, for the global values that the Antarctic offers for its climate reasons, its science collaboration, its peace. All of those things are really important. Um, it would take a hell of a lot longer to unpack this, but yeah, I do think that there is a modicum of chance. We do not have to go down the route of giving in and the treaty nations have shown that they've been prepared to take on quite challenging issues in the past. Thank I'm you. I'm not sure I answered, but good enough. No, that's, that, that's fine. Shirley? Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, I can put on either an optimist hat or a pessimist, I guess. Um, because there's a flip side, like probably my presentation was more on the optimist side. I don't know how it was received, but by saying that those who are the long time um, participants in the system have a bit of an institutional advantage, I think there's also a risk there that um, I think we have to really pay attention to the changing rhetoric on the part of other actors and how some just slight shifts or twists in rhetoric can actually turn things in a, head in a different direction and I don't want to elaborate too much because I haven't done all my analysis but what I took from that meeting actually that I'm going to be building into my work is just some of the little phrases and different types of approaches by which what appeared to be the similar rhetoric that's always upheld the system could actually end up being twisted and even undermine it and um, so I well, I don't know whether that answers the question, but maybe it's a contribution. No, that's that's. Uh, I'm looking forward to the analysis, shall I? Um, I'm going to hand a question over in this direction. Thanks, Tony. Um, it's Ellie Lee. Yeah, that's right. And this one's for Indy. Um, so Tony mentioned at the start that we've seen a lot of media coverage of Antarctic issues in the last week or so, which I, I agree with. And you mentioned how much misunderstanding there is, which I also agree with. We sometimes see um, comments in the press, mainly from the Daily Maverick, <laughs> about the uh, treaty system or the ATCM is not being transparent enough to media. So I'm wondering, uh, are we seeing a kind of failure of PR on the part of the ATCPs, or is this just something we have to look at that's going to be the case always? Yeah, I think I probably touched on it um, in what I said, but yeah, I do think that to combat that, there needs to be better communication from. I think what the treaty meeting, treaty parties and secretariat find themselves in a bit of a tangle as to who will communicate and how will they communicate. And I think that's solvable, but at the moment they're in that kind of who who says what. 
Um, and we also need, I think we've got journalists out there that are that are well educated and all those sorts of things that can um, that can tell the story a bit better. But I think everyone in the system needs to work out how they do that in a in a way. But I mean, you can you can take lots of messages from the report itself and communicate quite accurately from that. Um, so I guess it's just a, I think it's definitely something they have to focus on. I think they're beginning to, like with changes to websites that Shirley highlighted and things like that. But I think it more needs to be done. It needs to be less legalese and more more public, definitely. I'll go one step further. And I'm, I've drifted slowly into the Andrew Darby um, stream of thought on this. I think much more of the Antarctic Treaty meetings and Camelot meeting should be open to the public, should be broadcast, um, should be able to be seen by people outside of the, the bureaucrats and officials that attend them. Other international meetings. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, a question up the back. Hi, Tara Martin. Um, the, the Antarctic Treaty was set up at a time that the majority of powers were Western and we, the next superpower will not be Western. And I think we're starting to see that and this challenge to the Western concept of consensus-based decision-making through the treaty. Are we skirting the edge where the treaty actually isn't fitting um, the narrative that fits non-Western countries? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Tara. Um, yeah, look, certainly, you know, the big... Um, Potential geopolitical challenges in the sort of challengers, as in countries that are challenging within the international system, you know, are non Western. So that, that's correct. And I think one way of reading the, you know, the, the period we're in now is uh, one where the, the United States you know, is in retreat, you know, you know, politics, you know, military, political influence. Um, so it's a different world we're moving into. Um, and it's true that. You know, the, the system as it was set up in Washington in 1959 was very one which was, you know, based on the rules based international order, which was mentioned earlier. So, you know, consensus based liberal Western kind of system. Um, having said that, I, I think we need to try and hold on to it. You know, um, uh, there is no more attractive option, I think, for the system that would accommodate certainly Australia's interests than. And other Western nations' interests. Um, but having said that, I think we do. This is coming back to the, the end of my presentation. I think we do have to get a little more comfortable in talking about the arbitrary system in terms of conflicts going on within the system. I mean, certainly, I, my experience the last sort of ten or so years working on this. Is that you know conflict is sort of said in hushed terms. You know, it's, 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 everyone loves to talk about you know cooperation and facilitation and collaboration and consensus. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of kumbaya kind of vibe that you know we, we kind of live under. Um, we, I, that's not the reality. We you know behind the scenes there's always been stuff going on. But I think in this era now we need to talk a little more about conflict between states in the system, you know, that Russia and China have different perspectives, different interests, different interpretations that they're trying to bring into the system. And Australia, US, other um, you know, like-minded states are, are in conflict to that extent, okay? But I think it's okay to talk about that, because as I said, one of the roles of international law, some of the important work in international law, is to manage those sort of conflicts within the system, so within the institutions, whether it's, you know, dispute resolution processes or whether it's just within the meetings themselves, but the language of international law, the processes of international law should be used to try and resolve and diffuse and come to a, a resolution of those types of conflicts. And it's okay, I think, to talk about the role of the work of international law and the treaty system in that way. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. Is there any, one last question before I... Question. Do you want me just to shout? No, no. There's a microphone heading in your general direction. I'm very influenced by a conversation that I had with Sir Guy Green many years ago when he talked about the treaty process as really uh, its possible exemplar for the rest of the world. 
of actually showing the possibilities of trust and reciprocity and all the rest of it. I'm wondering whether you still think that is possible. I'd love to know if Sir Guy thinks that. Guy, would you like to answer that question? I'm not sure if I directly, but I, uh, I, I would make a plea still for uh, uh, not being a plea for the optimistic approach uh, to the uh, to the treaty. Um, uh, we, we, what we have to remember is the extraordinary power of the treaty that it's, uh, I know we've all talked about it a bit, but uh, it has built up a culture uh, which has never existed in the world before. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, uh, still um, immensely strong. The, the treaty still exists, it's still survived, it's still doing effective work. And in particular areas, it's demonstrably working in the so China as an example. China is not breaking any rules uh, within the Antarctic treaty system. Uh, whereas, let's take a, a, contra, a, a comparison in relation to its attitude to the law of the sea, to my choice, um, I think it, it does break a lot of rules. Uh, but it's a very different, uh, uh, and that's just one example of the Antarctic treaty system being quarantined uh, from the general international geopolitics. It's not entirely quarantined. But it is very largely, and that's still what we can to reinforce that. One other example from China is um, uh, the way it expressed itself in the debates uh, about uh, marine protected areas. The arguments uh, that are seen were expressed with moderation, they're reasonable. Uh, and I must say, if I've been hearing them as arguments in a court, might have found in favour of China. <laughs> Recently, uh, it, it isn't good. And, um, we, we, what we can be aiming to do is, uh, is doing what we can to reinforce the culture. And that may be something we can do as individuals and the academics um, try and increase the number of collaborating papers and publications and research. Um, Having a lot more visits on the on the continent, I don't know. They very very much about uh, how often they are occurring, but um, no, I'm stopping them. Anyway, that it reinforce the culture and don't give it up. Yeah. Thank you, Guy. Look, uh, it's um, we're running um, a little bit over time, a little bit over schedule time. But uh, is there any last comment? Very short comment that anyone would like to make. Okay, I'll make one. Ah, Ewan, come on, over to you. Thank, thanks, Tony. Is that on? It's on. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Ewan McIver, uh, Antarctic Division. As someone who um, has worked in this space for government for a long time and continues to do so, and there are a few of us in the room, as a comment, I just wanted to thank all the speakers very much for their presentations and for the scholarship that is reflected in them. I think at least one of the risks to the continuing strength and stability of the Antarctic Treaty System is a runaway narrative about risks to the strength and continuing stability of the Antarctic Treaty System. So having such well-considered, measured and pragmatic views put into the mix, I think is immensely valuable in counterbalancing some of the perhaps less well considered and researched views. So thanks for your work, keep it up. And I hope there are um, some people in the room who will keep that up into the future as well. Thanks. Well, I'm not going to say anything after that, uh, except to uh, invite our host to, to close. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Tony, and thanks, panel. It's hard to hear those comments.
I was going to say something just like that. <laughs> I feel enormously enriched that we have the quality of the people who are on this panel and in this audience in Tasmania to provide us locally, us nationally, and us as part of the world um, in their vision as we move forward and the threats, um, but also the major um, opportunities that we've got to keep this jolly ship on track. Um, so thanks enormously to all of the panel members. It's been great. Um, thanks to AIA members. And if you aren't a member, please join us. We are very happy to have you and we do really good presentations. And particularly thanks to Marcus and Jeff and Tony for sorting out um, the organisation for today. Now I've got a really, really, really boring thing to say. Could you please bring your glasses outside? <laughs> <laughs> she wants me. I'll take it.